Hello, this is Chris Case from Open Mind Space, and this is the Open Mind Space podcast. So tonight's episode will be airing on July 14th at midnight on the Voluntary Virtues Network, and I would like to talk to you about ritual versus spontaneous order and how genuine harmony can only be created without coercion. This is something that I believe most anarchists understand on some level from a Western philosophical standpoint. Interestingly enough, though, there are various Eastern schools of thought which also have a similar view. I've long been a uh, student of the Tao Te Ching, one of the main documents that people who are interested in Taoism read. And I've also found Zen Buddhism interesting. They have a way with understanding how things are best accomplished with without coercion. And they write about it in great depth, and they even write about how, if you have a state, you know, how it should really be functioning non-coercively. You want the horses to be plowing fields and not pulling chariots uh, of armies and pulling people into battle. If you have weapons, you want them stored away when nobody sees them. You don't want them out being used. You want to strategize yourself. You know, if we go into the art of war, for example, you want to win the battle before you even go out on the field. You want to make yourself invincible before you ever are challenged. There's nothing mythical about any of this stuff. It's just understanding the nature of reality and living your life accordingly. And that's, I think, what Taoism is all about. It's just about understanding what actually is and not coming up with preconceived notions about it and trying to fit it into a set of traditions or rituals or patterns that uh, ignore the nature of what it is you're dealing with. That's where one fails, I think, is when they really start to apply rules to everything. The rules always have exceptions. You know, you may you may be able to have some kind of general understanding of how certain things behave, but if you're too caught up in your rules and your traditions and your patterns, you're not going to be attuned to the reality that you're a part of. And if you're not attuned to that reality, you're not going to live as rich and full of a life and, and be as effective in, in the things that you do. So I would like to actually read a couple of little snippets to explain. Of course, these are translations. Um, probably been through several iterations. There's one in particular, though, that uh, I find particularly interesting. Um, this is a translation of the Tao Te Ching. I believe it was uh, some kind of interpolation. Um, I'll 
post links from uh, on the Open Mind Space uh, wiki where you can get all of this, all these documents in, in full. I'm gonna do my best to get all of this up there so that you can easily get it. I mean, these are ancient documents and they're all over the place, but I want to provide this for you so that you can find it in one place. So the chapter on ritual goes as follows. Well-established hierarchies are not easily uprooted. Closely held beliefs are not easily released. So ritual enthralls generation after generation. Harmony does not care for harmony, and so is naturally attained. But ritual is intent upon harmony, and so cannot attain it. Harmony neither acts nor reasons. Love acts, but without reason. Justice acts to serve reason, but ritual acts to enforce reason. When the way is lost, there remains harmony. When harmony is lost, there remains love. When love is lost, there remains justice. And when justice is lost, there remains ritual. Ritual is the end of compassion and honesty, the beginning of confusion. Belief is a colorful hope or fear, the beginning of folly. The sage goes by harmony, not by hope. He dwells in the fruit, not the flower. He accepts substance and ignores abstraction. This is uh, this chapter has resonated with me for years, and I've pondered on it for as long as I've read this document, which is I've been reading this probably since I was a in my late teens. So it's probably been about 14, 15 years that I've been reading this. I don't read this all the time, but it's something I tend to go back to. It's one of the more profound. I love the simplicity of it. I love the um, how with such a small amount of writing, it probes so deeply into the heart of, of things. And... In essence, you know, they're describing what plagues probably almost every established society. The desire to have the comfort of basically ritual, which is just ritualistic behavior that people use to feel comfortable about, comfortable and certain and secure. And this behavior enthralls people. It, it it kind of traps them and hypnotizes them into patterns that they aren't even aware of. And, well, I'll, I'll give you this. You know, it's you probably have to have, have it on some level. You probably have to have some amount of it. I doubt you could live with completely without this. I mean... at least depending on the state of, of people's minds and civilization and whatnot. But as it is right now, you know, it is important on some level to have some predictable kind of ritual, ritualistic behavior. But I think this is more of an individual thing, you know, something that you look at in yourself and you realize, you know, what the world is like around you and how it operates. But within your own life, you can try to be more in touch with harmony, with creating harmony in your life, with acting in the moment and, you know, just getting past the, the bullshit of, of all these kind of, uh, understandings that everybody's trying to give you about how you're supposed to act, how the world's supposed to be. You know, many of these modes of behavior that we have in our society 
only perpetuate our problems. They, instead of just having a problem one time, we repeat the behavior that created that problem over and over and over again. And that's pretty much the essence of statism. You know, statism is just a collection of, a massive, massive collection of rituals. You know, that's what laws are. They're just, there's laws and all these institutions and edicts, and it just, over time, it grows and grows and grows, and it becomes ever more imposing, ever more coercive, ever more violent. It almost never shrinks and it almost never improves. You know, you, you may have technological improvements that change things that, you know, could provide temporary relief or temporary improvement. But by and large, these rituals are, they're like a tax. Maybe they're not completely avoidable. But uh, there's way more than is necessary. You know, when you see these um, examples, like uh, many, you see it all over the news feeds, you know, if you're connected to, to people who follow um, things like police brutality and, and all the stupid um, laws that are passed and all the stupid things that the government does with their military and with their welfare state and all that kind of stuff. You see it all the time. It's all these, um, in an effort to create harmony, you know, which is what the government wants you to believe they're trying to do is make a more harmonious, you know, safe, secure, harmonious society. They use a shit ton of coercion and in the process, they create chaos. You know, you have all these people acting ritualistically, all these cops, for instance, you know, uh, they're merely following these ritualistic laws. They don't care about the reality of the situation. To them, oh, I've got to follow a law's a law, and I've got to follow it, and I've got to enforce it. And uh, Or they may not even follow it, but they feel like they've got to enforce it. And so... You see situations like, on, on so many occasions, take families, for example, where a parent gets, violates some idiotic law that's like a crime against the state, which is a victimless crime, basically. Uh, there's so many of these on the books, uh, so many of these stupid laws. And uh, the parent gets in trouble for this law, they get... Uh, thrown in jail and their family gets ripped apart or they lose their job or it just creates all this havoc or there's all these stupid laws that are maybe well intended you know trying to protect children or something of that sort but when you look at the application of it you see that what actually ends up happening is children get ripped apart from their families and they get put in these quite often these foster homes family gets drained economically through having to fight a legal battle they get drained emotionally it tears them apart it traumatizes them and all all of it is uh, basically a bunch of robotic systems and and people you know agents of the state lawyers and all their collaborators, they work together to dutifully repeat all of these rituals. You know, people get caught with drugs and things of that sort, or they have the wrong size magazine on their gun, or any number of things. There's countless, countless things that that we do that are just normal behavior that are perfectly, where we're perfectly at harmony with our fellow man. Where if the state were to 
you know, some agent of the state were to become aware of it, they would feel it their duty to coercively change your behavior, to punish you, to penalize you, to stop you with coercion. So the intent behind it, maybe at least at the inception of the the creation of the rules, was to create harmony. But that's not how harmony is attained. I mean, if we take the an analogy of a pond, you know, you've got a pond with a bunch of, you've gone in there and uh, stirred it up with a bunch of waves. You know, you've taken your hands and just stirred it up or taken a paddle and stirred it up. And uh, it's a pond on a windless day. You know, the way to return it to harmony is just to let it alone. It will settle. It will equilibrium will be regained. But the way the state tries to do it is they say, "Oh, there's waves. We'd better neutralize these waves." And it's like taking a big paddle and trying to offset the waves. But really, it just gets wavier and wavier, and more and more chaos is created by it. That's what coercion does. It's what it does, you know, in the sphere of the state. It's what it does in the business world. It's what it does in our in our families. It's what it does in our own minds. It, this is a concept that you can apply on, on any level. And that's, I think, the beauty of of this simple understanding. You know, there's so many problems in the world that have the same cause. And it's because of our thinking about how how to go about solving problems. I noticed that there's, do you ever know, so, have you ever known somebody who takes everything really seriously? Like they can't, they just can't have a good time. Whether it be, you know, somebody who's a parent and they've got kids or they're at work trying to do their work, you know, trying to solve problems or whatever it is they do at their work. But they always have to have a bad time with it. They always have to be aggressive and coercive with it. And you can tell that it's something that goes on in their own heads, that they themselves don't realize the deleterious effects of their own coercive attitude about everything. And you can hear it in their voice. It's almost like they're always they're always on the verge of yelling. They're always kind of grunting their way through life. They wouldn't know how to recognize a good time if it bit them on the ass. It's that bad with with some of these people. And I notice it with it's really noticeable with people who are parents because they have to express themselves a lot. Like if they have young children, they have to express themselves a lot because they're always having to interact with their children. And you see them, they're just always like, you know, raising their voice at their children and trying to control their behavior, trying to just micromanage them. And thinking that this is somehow going to produce harmony in the lives of their children it's just like being a state it's just like uh like the state tries to operate you know thinking you can just write the perfect set of laws perfect foundational document and that that will somehow fix all your problems you'll have checks and balances and all this other fabled nonsense that the state claims creates great harmony in the world 
but that's what you see is you see these these parents they don't even notice that they're doing it and and it's it always you know ever since i had my own children and i really focused in on raising them non-coercively and calming my own emotions and reviewing, you know, looking back, uh, you know, retrospectively on a regular basis at my behavior. Like, I like to look back at my behavior. You know, this is a constant process. That Self-cultivation is a constant process. And we all have to do it, you know, we may not be focusing on that particular concept all the time, but we've got to look back and we've got to see who we really are. And we've got to see how well it's working out and be honest about it, you know? And I've been cultivating this in myself and I, you know, I, I've always got work to do. I mean, I think we've all got work to do no matter where we're at, but I've done a lot of work on it. and. I can catch myself if I start feeling coercive, uh, intense arising in me. I can catch that before I act on it and understand it and let it go. And in a way, it kind of allows me to let go even more than I had before because I feel that upwelling in my, in my mind and in my being. And it gives me an understanding of what's going on deep down inside. So rather than just blurting it out and letting it out uh, and, and giving making everybody have a bad time and experience the negativity of, uh, of me trying to coercively do something that is obviously not going to work, not going to help anything, you know, when I'm handling it well, I'll notice that and I'll learn something from it. And, and rather than it being a necessarily negative experience, it's like a, it's like pulling a weed. It's like, oh, there's a weed. I didn't realize that. You know, going through the experience of your life is kind of like cultivating a garden in a way. You know, it's constantly got to be cultivated. There's constantly weeds coming up. You need to pull those weeds and then you can take those weeds. And uh, I think, in uh, some traditions, uh, farmers would take the weeds that they'd pulled up and they'd bury them, and those weeds would then become fertilizer. They, you know, would compost under the underneath the soil or in the compost pile, and would become fertilizer. And that's how it should be in your in your mind. You know, you've got uh, all sorts of different energies going through your mind at any at any given time and and you weren't trained most likely to understand the mind on a very deep level and so we're all kind of uh, amateurs at dealing with the mind at dealing with all the the pressures all the forces and emotions and factors that are tugging at us constantly that we've got to keep in balance it's a very challenging thing to do and to remain at your center and and the only way to really do it is to raise your awareness and to gradually cultivate yourself so that you can grow as a person and this is one of those kind of things where if Self-cultivation, you know, it's something that happens on an individual level. But the more of us that do this, the more novel life becomes for everyone. So, for instance, you know, to take it back to something that many of you may be familiar with, I've had several experiences of kind of realization where like I've been on you know Facebook for a long time and I've been connecting and networking with uh, people who are libertarians or 
conservatives or anarchists or, you know, just people who are, um, understand certain concepts that I resonate with. And I've noticed that, um, I think people go through cycles of evolution as they, as they do this, but I noticed on many occasions I would kind of step back and I would realize that most of these people, at least at the time of the realization, are just echoing off of each other. They're just repeating what one another says, what, what's already been said, what's already been done. That, that in, a, in a way, is a kind of ritual. It's like they, they maybe agree on certain concepts. Many of these are great concepts, I'm sure. But there's not a lot of going beyond that and going taking it to the next level. And, you know, of course, the next level is, you know, they want something. They want to, to see greater harmony in society. How do you create the greater harmony in society? Well, repeating what's already been repeated for, you know, tens if not hundreds of years by authors or speakers or whoever they are, that can have an effect that can kind of bring those concepts to life in the modern mind, and that's that's wonderful. But we've also got to figure out just how that translates into action. Because the world is just people acting, people doing. And you can have great principles and philosophies and and whatnot, but um, in order for it to actually change, our actions have to change. We can't expect to go through the same routine every single day, plus maybe reading a book about something and or sharing quotes and memes and things of that sort while still acting, you know, in the concrete actions that we actually do the same exact way. You know, I, I remember some, I spent much of my, my childhood, of course, in public school and uh, watching television, watching movies things like that. That was a pretty, you know, doing homework, going to school activities. That was a pretty normal childhood, I guess. After a while, though, I started to notice the pattern, though. You know, it seemed new for a while because you're, you're new to the world and you haven't seen everything. You haven't seen all the basic uh, archetypes and patterns yet. But after a while, I think when I started getting into my teen years, maybe high school age, I guess, and especially when I was in uh, of college age, uh, my 20, early to mid-20s, I started to see these patterns. I would say it must have been in my teens, actually, when this really started to hit home. I started to see, you know, repetition in television shows and movies and just I watched so many hours of this stuff that I started to see the patterns and I was like I was starting to get bored with it. I was like, why why are we sitting in front of you know, the I think the average American, I guess, spends something like four hours a day watching television shows. That's what the number was back then. I don't know what it is now and how how the different mediums have changed that, but that's uh, supposedly uh, what the number was. So I started to realize, you know, this is where my time's going. My time is going to spend, you know, sitting here and repeating the same thing over and over again, watching commercials for a bunch of the time, watching shows that repeat the same shit 
watching movies that rehash the same stuff. You know, occasionally a show or a movie would be something fantastically groundbreaking, you know, at least to me. But uh, by and large, it wasn't. By and large, it was just uh, walking in a circle over and over again. Not walking down a path, but walking in a circle. And really, I'd rather be walking down a path. I'd rather be getting somewhere, seeing new things, experiencing novelty. And that's when I started getting interested, you know, more and more, especially as I read more about Eastern philosophy. I started getting inter interested in things like Tai Chi. And what I would do is I would, the you know, watching the TV and all that, I it started to see it as here, an analogy I would, would say now. I mean, it was kind of like you may as well just lay down in a coffin and close the door on your coffin. Just lay there for the whole evening. That's more or less what it seemed like, just watching blinking lights or, you know, just uh, doing the same shit over and over again. So I would, uh, I, you know, it just became pointless to me. And I started learning more and more about, you know, just practicing Chinese martial arts and Tai Chi. And, and uh, I found that it was way more interesting. And what I found interesting about it is that I was getting to experience my mind, body, and spirit on a level that I had never experienced before in my life. I was getting to, like, I would walk out, there was this golf course nearby, and the putting, or the, uh, sorry, the place where you tee off is generally very flat, so I would go there, and I would practice this Tai Chi, and I would start to feel all this energy moving around my body, and I would start to feel this kind of hyper-awareness and this kind of clarity. It's like, um, it's almost like if you had um, dew in your eyes, or or just uh, always were kind of fuzzy-headed or cloudy, you know, had cloudy vision, and you go out and you do this for even as little as 20, 30 minutes, um, and you just notice a complete change in your whole experience of reality, you know, like a, a level of harmony internally inside of your, the deepest core of your being that is just unimaginable in the previous, you know, in the other paradigm that you were in, in the highly ritualized and controlled paradigm. You know, this ritualized controlled paradigm is it's geared towards controlling your behavior, keeping you busy, you know, keeping you in the same set of experiences. This is unbounded experience. This is a chance for you to really get to know yourself. Uh, and that's why I think things like meditation and uh, anything that is a form of meditation, which I consider Tai Chi a form of meditation. I consider yoga a form of meditation. Um, can help you to, to know yourself better and can help you to break out of patterned behavior. And, I mean, I think reading can do that too. But there's something about this experience, this kind of, there's no words necessarily, there's no... It's just you either sitting and meditating and letting your mind still itself like that pond or moving and just becoming one with your body and your movements to where when you are done with it and you then come back and face the world again, you see the world anew. You see all the things that were invisible to you. You see all the little mindless rituals and patterns. And it becomes much more apparent what's actually going on because you got to step out of it and you got to be away from it for a while. And then you come back into it and you see how thoughtless so much of it is. And I think that people who are libertarians or anarchists uh, tend to have the ability to do this perspective 
with things like statism because they they don't believe that it's necessary. They don't believe it's a that it's a very good way of operating a society. So they are accustomed to thinking outside of it, to understanding that it would be better if society were less of a coercive place, that less of a you know that there were less centralized power uh, monopolies dominating everyone and imposing their will coercively and complicating everything. And that's that's one wonderful thing about this particular group of people and that's why I maybe that's why I just so easily identify with them why when I learned about this philosophy when I kind of moved beyond the the minimal government constitutional uh, nonsense and when I finally just let go of all that and just completely let go it was like a big weight was lifted from me and I no longer had to carry that crap around and I could finally just sleep easy at night knowing that the internal logic of my being is consistent at all levels or at least it was far more consistent than it had been I mean we've all got contradictions and and things of that sort that we've got to work out and work on. But I finally was able to get rid of that old rusty sword of the state and not validate it in any way. And things have come together beautifully since then. Of course, it creates conflict in my life because there's many other people who have never ventured down that path and it's it's difficult to in certain circumstances to um to interact with them when you see them you know mindlessly doing things that are upsetting that either affect you or that are just plain upsetting um but aside from that you know that's bound to happen i mean there's a lot of different kinds of people in life and you've got to deal with them um, but that's an opportunity for personal growth so I guess what I you know what I'm getting at on a fundamental level here is that uh, I really appreciate what I've learned from from anarchists and and libertarians and about what they what they've uncovered and what they've written and produced over the years and i think that if there's anything i can help to bring into the fold it is that there's much that can be learned from studying Eastern philosophy as well, and honing your mind, body, spirit, you know, complex, and being able to, to really not only have this rational world on the outside of you, but have a real understanding of your inside, your internal world. And I don't think that um, Western philosophy adequately addresses that in most cases. I think that uh, many of these Eastern practitioners really did work very hard on developing the internal world and cultivating it. And they saw it as a real thing, as, you know, not as some kind of... Uh, sketchy abstraction that is uh unreal not as um uh, you know I, I think the uh most people in the western world seem to fall into very few categories when it comes to how they and this is of course just my perspective i could be wrong but i see it as uh there's a few categories that i've seen in the Western world, 
uh, that tend to dominate, you know, tend to be predominant, you know. Uh, one would be like the religious way of perceiving one's self, you know, like uh, Christianity or, um, you know, Christianity being the biggest one in all the various forms of Christianity. And personally, I see that as a very, uh, you know, one can possibly um, evolve through that if they uh, if they came into it as a decent person, you know. But uh, there's a lot of complexity to it, and there's a lot of a lot of things that could derail one in their search because there's a, a lot of coercion and violence and horrible things, you know, in these books. And I've seen so many people embrace it as you know, trying to create harmony by embracing this complicated script, you know, dogma and and getting into ritualistic behavior through it. And, uh, you know, maybe there's value to be gained by just reading these books and trying to understand the lessons that you can get out of it. But trying to um, set up a strict set of rules that is just for the sake of having rules and to, to claim that, you know, there's some supreme being that's set forth these rules and that if you disobey them that something coercive is going to happen to you it's just the same kind of thing as uh, statism it's uh it's just an internal statism um it's a very deep level and i think maybe it's in many ways it may be the root of the modern day state you know they always say it has christian roots <laughs> well that wouldn't surprise me at all i mean there's some good basic behavioral standards on some level, but there's also a lot of really horrible behavioral standards that are espoused in some of these books. And we have to have a you know an internal harmony about ourselves to understand these things. So I mean, really, the the value is is going to be limited by that. We've got to already have you know the the core understanding of ourselves and how the world is and, and, and so on before, you know, we even delve into these complicated texts. And so I, I think the value is, is limited there. So I've found that many people who are who are religious often don't search for deeper answers. They they have faith. They just say, well, as long as I follow these rules, I'll go to heaven and I can leave it leave it at that. I think that's the basic attitude. I know I'm simplifying it greatly, but um, that was what my experience of Christianity was, at least, is uh, curiosity is not very uh, well tolerated. You're, if you're curious, like I even went to a relatively... A moderate church when I was a, a kid, and uh, I was curious about all sorts of things, and many of the things, you know, seemed ridiculous. And I would ask questions, and I would, I would be coerced, you know, I would be sent out of the room. Their ritual is so strong that you can't even question it. It's very well established, and it's not very easily uprooted. And the moment you try to uproot it, they kick your ass out. They get you away from from them because they don't want to hear it. They don't want to. They think that's the only way. They aren't spontaneous. They aren't able to have spontaneity. That is scary to them. And that's that's a problem for them, I think. Um, and then, okay, so we go on to looking at another kind of Western thought that... Uh, also has issues developing the internal world. I would say that just materialism, this kind of uh, materialist thought that many scientific people have 
Um, it's a belief system. There's certainly a lot of value in it in many regards. There's many things that are accomplished quite well and many kind of connections to reality that they're able to have that weren't previously possible without a grounding in materialism. Understanding, you know, the measurable world, the measurable, observable world that you can experiment in and and all that kind of stuff. The um, the area I think that materialism uh, fails, and this is what I think affects a lot of anarchists, because many of them are materialist atheists, um, is in the belief about the self and the mind and the brain. I think there's quite a bit assumed about these things through materialism, far more than they may themselves believe is assumed. And it's assumed that our entire being is just happenstance from a neurological network of cells that are connected and that that's what we are right there. That we're the physical cells that are connected to each other and that that somehow generates consciousness and reality. And that's not really, you know, there's certainly things you can experiment on and find that, you know, damaging certain parts of the brain does indeed damage one's faculty for certain things. But I don't uh, know that they've actually gotten anywhere close to proving that the brain creates consciousness. I'm partial to the idea that the brain is more of a interface with the body and consciousness is actually a another phenomena that may not be necessarily explainable by material uh, explanations. And part of the challenge that you have here is that we are experiencing reality through consciousness. So it's kind of like, um, you know, as a simp simpler analogy, you know, if you had a camera and you wanted to study that camera you would have a very difficult time doing so because you are, you know, it, let's say all you could do was view things through the camera in order to study the camera. Well, you're viewing things through the camera. You can kind of understand some characteristics of that, but uh, it's going to be a very roundabout study. And the study of consciousness is the same kind of way. You know, we, we obviously we have a consciousness, we have an awareness, we can we can see, taste, touch, hear, smell. And there are things that we can do, I think, that are not so simple as just those five senses. And that's something that you get into when you start talking about energy and the meridian system in the body, the, the chakras, the meridians, the the chi, and all these kind of subtle energetic forces that the Eastern uh, practitioners of various arts have refined and, and come to an understanding of themselves. through self-cultivation. So, you know, we can project our thought and our, uh, we can project our intent out into our bodies and into the world around us. And it's through doing this that we can understand the nature of consciousness through cultivating ourselves. But I don't get that impression, though, with the materialist philosophy. 
it's more you know trying to reduce everything down to neurons firing and it seems like a a big red herring in a way because i mean you may be able to understand the brain body relationship and eventually gain some higher knowledge after many many decades of study But I think the level of depth of knowledge about yourself that you can gain from that is limited. And so you've got to keep it to its proper sphere, I think. It's going to be valuable in, in some regard in knowing how the brain and the body interrelate and how to maybe repair lost functionality in the event of injury or cure certain diseases or, or so on. But consciousness is a much different phenomenon that requires a mastery of self that um, I don't think all the scientific studies and measurements uh, in the world can really can really get to because those are just too um, complex you know they're they're too it's a very personal thing you know our mind is a very personal thing and we've got to be able to still it and to calm it and to study it through constant feedback and constant awareness and that's something I don't see really uh, embarked upon by, by many people who have the uh, materialist uh, sort of uh, mindset they're more about you know methodology and statistics and studies and all that kind of stuff, and that puts you out in abstraction and not in the actual, you know, it puts you in the flower, not the fruit. You know, you want to be in the fruit of your experience. You want to be in the field of your own experience, in your own field of energy. Um, experimenting with yourself, seeing how you, how your body acts, you know, meditating and trying things, seeing what actually works, you know, for yourself. And you may not be able to make conclusions about what works for everybody, but you can figure out what works for yourself. How to bust out of old habits, out of old rituals, routines, and to live a more rich and novel life. So those are the, I mean, you either have, I mean, as far as getting back to like the overall kinds of, of thought that you see in the West that, that I see as lacking, you've got the religious thought, you you know, like the Christian kind of religious thought, which I think is limited in various ways just due to often a lack of curiosity in most cases. You've got the materialist thought that is limited due to just rigid beliefs about what consciousness can be and how this it's believed that it's just a an accident and that it's a material phenomenon you know it's viewing consciousness as a material phenomenon even though we are actually experiencing reality through a more energetic phenomena and that the material may merely be a representation in our minds of something that's actually energy I mean, we know that matter is energy, that it's like looping energy of some sort. It's all one and the same. It's interchangeable. And consciousness is the experience of matter, or that's part of it. You know, it's our experience of our, of our existence through matter. And then, of course, we've got dreams, which is a completely... Uh, energetic sort of experience but there's matter representations in our dreams too so it seems like there has to be some kind of matter for consciousness to act on whether it's in our dreams or in the quote unquote physical world
and I would hope that wherever one comes from, that they'd be able to recognize this, and that they'd be able to, you know, expand on their on their philosophy and, and recognize its limitations, and delve into themselves, delve inward, and listen to themselves and know themselves, because it is this self knowledge, you know, really gaining genuine self knowledge. And facing yourself as a beginner, not as an expert. You know, it's like everybody thinks they're an expert. Or many people at least think they're experts. They think they're an expert on, you know, like if you're a religious person, you think you know, you know what's going to happen when you die. You know why you're here. You know that God created the world and that if you do these things, you're bad and you should go to hell and or if you're a statist, you know that the state has to exist and that there would be chaos without it and that um, police officers have to follow all these rules and rituals and lock people up for stupid reasons and that that's just the way it has to be. Or if you're a scientist, you just know that the the Big Bang had to have occurred and it, you know exactly what happened in the first microsecond and... All of these things that you just really, really, when you're honest with yourself, you just have to say, you don't really know these things. It's maybe a stance that you've chosen to take. It may be the best that you can come up with, but you don't really know it. And I think odds are that given time, almost all of it will fall by the wayside and be found to be a mere superstition of some sort, you know, a mere, a mere uh, misunderstanding of the nature of reality. Because our understanding is, is always going to be evolving. New information is going to be coming in. And if we're trapped in belief systems, whether it be science, religion, statism, or just pure apathy, you know, these people that are, you know, I didn't even cover that. You know, the people who are just completely don't give a shit about anything, aren't curious about anything. They just want to prop in front of the tube, watch simulated versions of reality, and not think about anything. Eat, have their products that make them comfortable, and and just simulate a real existence through the tube and not think, and that thinking and that discourse upsets them and makes them want to want to go away, they want to get away from it. You know, they're the kind of people that the moment you start bringing up anything that's not some form of escapism, they want to leave the room. They want to get away from you. They're like, why aren't you talking about the football game or the soccer game? Why aren't you aware of those things? You know, those are the things that are really important, right? Not your relationship with yourself. No, that's not important. Or understanding, you know, things that we can do to make a more harmonious society, to reduce the amount of suffering in the world, or to at least learn how to cope with the suffering that inevitably will be there. You know, that's what I think Buddhism is all about is understanding that suffering is a part of of physical existence and that on some level we just have to learn the reality of the situation and to accept it and to become one with it and to not let it not torture ourselves about it You know, there will always be some frontier to cross. You know, even if you get the kind of world that you imagine would be ideal, once you get there, you'll find that there's some other 
frontier to cross. Your awareness will have expanded to that horizon, and then you'll see all the challenges that await thenceforth. A whole new set of challenges, probably far more challenging. And it will be wonderful to have that, to have those basics taken care of, you know, if and when that ever happens. Just to get past some of these silly things that, these silly kind of ritualistic patterns that have been repeated over and over again and have never worked out and have always plagued humanity for countless generations in one form or another. It just keeps changing forms. You know, I. you can th think about just in the last uh, few, you know, last couple of thousand years, you've got all these different ways that people have tried to try to somehow control things, try to somehow have a the illusion of order, but through ritualistic means, through coercive means. Religion uh, or various tribal mechanisms, statism, all these different ways that it's been tried and it's failed because and it fails for the same reason because it, it's a fundamental misunderstanding about how true harmony is achieved it's not something you can force to happen no more than you can f force somebody to love somebody else or to have a good time. You know, you can't force these kind of things to happen. And there's, you know, harmony would be like the highest level, just true harmony. You know, and it's the kind of thing that you feel like when you're meditating or doing Tai Chi or reading a good book or having good sex or whatever it is. It's the kind of thing you feel you know that you have. At that point, you have reached a high state of excellence that you are harmonious in that moment but it's a fleeting thing it's not something you can just possess it's not something you can necessarily attain it's something that emanates from you when you're under the right circumstances in the right state of mind it emanates from you, and you cultivate it, and it grows, and it grows. And you don't necessarily possess it, because the moment you stop creating those conditions, the moment it goes away. You know, there's some interesting uh, theories that I that I like to think about, um, about the, the deep, deep history of humankind. And many believe that there was a highly advanced civilization prior to our prehistory that was wiped out in a disaster of some sort. So I, I think the, the understanding that I have is that there was a Ice Age civilization, and when the Ice Age melted, it created a lot of chaos and, you know, this chaos led to the downfall of that civilization, but that we still have evidence of it. So aside from, you know, getting too deeply into that, that theory, um, if there was some kind of Atlantis-type civilization, some highly advanced, you know, technological, spiritual, and otherwise, you know, civilization that just had many of the problems that we now are are fighting right now and dealing with uh had all that figured out obviously they didn't hold on to it you know if if they were if they were around at one point and had some vast understanding of reality it wasn't enough for them to hold on to and whether or not this is true i guess is a moot point but it is a challenge no matter where you are 
is maintaining your level of mastery of self because all of the great things that happen outside of you start with a mastery in yourself and all the great things that will happen in the world will happen or won't happen as a result of people choosing to master their own self and know themselves if they don't want to do that then a lot of ignorant shit is going to continue to happen. I mean, why do you think that cops, for instance, act so barbarically so often? I mean, why do you think that they are so quick to shove people or shoot people or arrest them over stupid things? Why is this? I mean, they're choosing to do this. They chose to become cops. And as cops, they every day are choosing to act in the manner that they are acting. Why would they do that? Wouldn't you think they would know that that doesn't work? Well, apparently they don't. They either don't know or they don't care. Or they have their shit so far, you know, their shit is so far not together uh, in, in terms of understanding reality, in terms of having their life sorted out, that that's just the way they're acting day to day just to get by. Their needs are just barely being met. And that's how they deal with it. They follow orders. They do what they're told to do. I think many of us do on some level. There's at some point where we will do what we're told to do because of fear, because of coercion, because of factors that really, if they weren't in our lives, we'd be able to grow a lot faster and a lot better, and we'd have our resources uh, allocated, I think, much more rationally. You know, if we had rational... Uh, understanding of ourselves and cultivated ourselves really uh, we're able to put our energy where it's most effective rather than just going through these blind routines where you've got to go somewhere for this amount of time every week and whether or not you're actually productive is irrelevant uh, on some level and follow the the you know follow the rules and the rituals and patterns and all that kind of stuff. You know, I see that there's a place for it on some level, but I think it often goes too far and it often wastes our potential. You know, um, often it's things that seem useless. Like, take Tai Chi, for example, I or meditation. Uh, yeah, meditation just as a simple example. You know, if a person were to actually go and meditate for 10, 20, 30 minutes, however long they can do it effectively, I would venture to guess that if they're any good at it, that in most cases, after they do do that, if they had something they, they needed to do, like a, ta a set of tasks they needed to do, a job they needed to do, they would do so far more effectively because their mind would be calmed down, they, their awareness would be stilled, and they may well be able to make up for that time they spent meditating. But these whole, you know, these kind of ritualistic systems, they don't account for that. They don't have that kind of awareness they just say oh you're not you're not at your desk you're not typing at your computer you must be wasting time not realizing that uh, you know the actual unfolding of one's you know reality is completely individualistic and 
that you can't just apply these broad concepts uh, to it about, you know, time. You know, t this time is a very abstract concept to begin with. And the experience of it. And, you know, I heard somebody, I think it was Stefan Molyneux on one of his podcasts saying that most people only really are very productive for about 20% of their time anyways. So what if you could go and meditate and become productive for 40% of your time? Then you're getting twice as much work out of it, you know? But these are not considerations that the average Western mindset is capable of really stepping back and, and doing because... Generally, you know, things are organized hierarchically and there's a desire to control people um, and to use coercion. And it's understandable. I mean, many people don't self-cultivate and if they didn't have some kind of silly rules, they wouldn't get anything done. <coughs> but that's where, you know, having more of a kind of a mass awakening could could pay off because, you know, as people do cultivate themselves more and wake up more, these silly rules will seem irrelevant to everyone, you know? So, I think it would make our lives much better in the long run if we were to get past these kinds of behavior where we're not being aware in the moment that we're actually experiencing, where we're kind of trying to escape from who we are, where we are, what we are. We need to be able to, to be in this experience and be aware of the fullness of it. And once we can do that, we'll see the answers to, to many of our most vexing problems. They'll just be obvious. You start to see the problems very easily. I've had so many experiences where I've gone and done some kind of meditative practice and then, you know, gone out away from everybody and then come back and just seen everything so clearly. Seen all of the problems that people carry around with themselves. It's like they carry it around. It's like leeches that are just stuck to them, sucking the life out of them, causing them problems from the inside out, emotional problems, things that they've probably, in many cases, been carrying around since childhood, never had a chance to heal gaping wounds and these kind of pattern behaviors keep the wound open it's like you have a cut and you just keep ripping the scab off over and over again leave it alone let that scab heal let yourself move beyond it you don't need this pain you know, one one thing I've noticed time and time again in Tai Chi is we try you try to relax. We try to genuinely relax. And I'm not talking about like slumped over in a chair, relax. I'm talking about letting go of unconscious tension in our bodies. And there is unconscious tension in all of us. And when you start to become aware of it, you you start to let go of the easy stuff, all the low hanging fruit. But you start to realize that you're just keeping this crap in you. That there's all these areas of your being, both of your physical body and your mental body, um, where you're just keeping this unconscious uh, energy in, inside of you. And when you let go of it, it's such a, such a feeling of relief. And you feel it start to come back from time to time, but then you are aware of it. You're aware of that's something that's not necessary. It's something that 
I only create when I'm not being aware of myself, and then you let go of it. Like, I notice it while driving, that there's certain muscles in certain areas, like in my legs and whatnot, that start to tense up, and I'm like, oh, there's that again. Let go of it. And you just will it with your mind, and it happens. And the more you do that, the more apt you are to be able to let go of it, the more you're able to control it. You, you refine it and refine it, and you become more powerful of a being as you do that. Because you learn the power of your own mind, and that it's a very, very powerful, um, you know, your, your spirit and your mind are very powerful. And if you refine that power gradually, you know, it's not something that just happens overnight. If you refine it gradually, you become more powerful every day, more aware. And common challenges and problems become easier. And so it's profitable to you. You know, if you're just purely in it for the profit, for being able to make more money, being able to do things with less effort, well, there you go. You've got it. You know, you're rash. it's rational, too. Seems irrational. You know, it seems irrational to the boss when he sees you meditating. It's perfectly rational. You're getting way more out of it. He's getting way more out of it. You're getting the job done. You're making less mistakes. You're more in touch with reality. You're more in touch with others. That's what it's all about. Whereas if you were just your standard kind of robotic rule following, instruction following, checklist using drone, you would have none of those insights. You'd be making mistakes. You would not understand the nature of what you're dealing with. You merely have a set of rules to follow that are very gross approximations of things. Which, getting back to statism, that's why statism doesn't work. It's just a bunch of gross approximations that maybe apply in certain situations, but there's all this, all these kind of injustices baked in there in order to fit certain pressure groups' preferences. But when it comes down to it, it doesn't match reality. And so we're all criminals in the mind of the state. We're all constantly committing quote-unquote crimes. In this, in this fucked up version of reality that agents of the state have. You know, those people who interface with and deal with and execute the, the quote-unquote will of this institution. They have these, just this whole fucked up conception of reality. Uh, it's not real at all doesn't match reality at all and consequently they use coercion and they hurt people and they destroy lives and they destroy potential which is probably the worst thing that they destroy they hold us back but we let them and we don't have to let them They may have certain level of control because of their domination of the physical world, because of their raw force and their willingness to use it. But they're a very small portion of the population. They can't control your mind. They can't control your everyday experience. Even if you were stuck in a jail somewhere, you would still have complete control over your mind. I mean, unless they drug the hell out of you or something like that. There's only so much of that they can do. There's only so much that they can accomplish co with coercion. But there's so much that you can accomplish in your own life with self-cultivation. With turning the garbage of your life into flowers. Taking the things that you don't like, understanding them, and turning them into the things that you do like. Raising your level of awareness. Solving your problems.
That's the whole point of it. It is the internal component to the rational self. And it's something that only you can do, because only you are inside of that mind of yours. And it's completely up to you how you use it. You can't farm that one out. You can't let an expert take care of it. You have to be the expert. So I think I'll wrap it up with that. I hope that uh, you've gotten something out of this. I know I have. It's been a fantastic exploration of some concepts, I think, that are uh, have the potential to really transform one's experience. And that's what I'm all about. So I hope you have seen the value in that and that it's made its impression. And I look forward to talking to you again next week.